We have Eric Brewer with me here today, and you can find him on Instagram by looking for Eric Brewer Invest. And I'm going to make sure to have that link in the show notes. But Eric, really appreciate your time today as we talk about the business aspect of real estate investing. I appreciate it, Jack. Thanks for having me. So Eric, a lot of people that listen to shows like this one, they are looking to get off of that starting line when it comes to real estate investing. What are some of those first things that people should consider before they decide to even get into real estate and investing as a business? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question because everybody starts at the same place, right? They, they buy a deal or they fund a deal or they invest in a deal or they partner up with someone. But I think what we don't talk a lot about is what are the sort of months and years leading up to that? Like what prompts you to consider getting into real estate? And I think it's important to diagnose that so that we don't allow either our or someone else's enthusiasm around real estate and investing to cloud our disciplined judgment about whether or not we quit our W-2, if we invest our 401k money into a, a crazy flip opportunity that someone told us was a great idea and really get clarity around why you're looking for a change and, and what you believe to be true about real estate investing that would solve that problem. Because I see a lot of people that, uh, a good example is, why'd you get into real estate? Oh man, I just wanted flexibility and schedule. And what they don't realize is that what's often preached as flexibility with schedule in real estate is sort of, people don't do a good job of, of clarifying what that means. And it means that your schedule needs to be flexible to accommodate your customers. Not, I get to pick and choose when I work, at least not in the beginning. Now, if we do a good job of building a business and some framework around us, we should have more freedom in our time and, and freedom of our schedule. But I hear that a lot where people get into real estate because they want flexibility and schedule and they come to find out that it's quite the opposite. So I think really clarifying on what you're, you're searching for and why that's important to you and then trying to align very clearly what it is about real estate and, and the path you're taking to real estate that you believe has a high percentage of likelihood to solve that problem or you're going to end up being disappointed. It's interesting you bring that up because I think a lot of people that get into real estate investing, they are sold a bill of goods, whether it's late night, get rich quick schemes or HGTV on flip this house in 30 yeah. minutes or less. So I, I, I think we have a distorted concept of reality when it comes to real estate investing and what kind of work it actually entails. Absolutely. It's a great way of recapping it. I also wanted to touch on the concept that a lot of people have seem to have a hard time seeing that initial steps in real estate investing as a business versus a hobby or side hustle. They, they don't actually treat it like a business. Are there some things that you would suggest people do or some actions that they should take to get them in the proper mindset and treat it as such? Yeah, I think it literally just starts with what you just said. It's almost every project I've been lucky enough to work on, whether it was my own business or, and I do some one-on-one -on -one coaching and consulting with other businesses. And step one is always unpacking our brain, right? There's typically a shift in, in beliefs or a shift in thinking that has to happen before we can really have decisive engagement on the real practical steps that come along with either starting a business, growing a business, or fixing a business. And I think it literally just starts with that. It's not like if people don't say I'm getting into the food delivery business, they say I'm starting a restaurant business. They don't say, yeah, I'm going to buy and sell cars. They go, I'm starting an automotive business. But for some reason, we've created this low barrier of entry to get into real estate that we don't treat it like a business. So I think it's quite frankly, it's the responsibility of folks like you and I to talk in that context more often. So that people that are listening to this and considering making a decision is they actually treat it what it should be, which I'm starting a business, right? And then what are the, the, the best practices? What do we know to be the do's and don'ts of starting a business versus how do I get into real estate? Like just literally changing the way that we talk about it and the language surrounding it, I think will start to sink in and people will treat it 
like, Hey, if I was going to start a restaurant business, I'd probably maybe want to get a franchise. Maybe I start with a subway or maybe I start with a, a, a Ruby Tuesdays or a McDonald's franchise. Cause they're going to give me the framework of how to run a successful business. So I think the first thing we have to do is just to be more transparent and authentic about what our real estate and entrepreneur journey has really been like too many people post pictures of them, you know, laying on the hoods of Lamborghinis and Corvettes and Ferraris. And they talk about how much freedom and time that they have and how they have this thriving business, but we didn't hear from them for about seven to 10 years while they were struggling and, you know, trying to make ends meet and wondering if they were going to be able to make payroll each Friday. I think too many people don't share that portion of their journey because it's not glamorous. And all they ever talk about is the desired end state. And it creates this illusion for people that they can have overnight success. When in reality, we've had a decade or more in my experience of behind the scenes work. And then we have overnight recognition, right? So what we see generally is overnight success is really a decade of work, unglamorous work, right? disciplined effort. And then we have overnight recognition. And I think it's really up to folks like you and I that have been around for a while and have some influence and can speak from experience to just be a little bit more transparent about what the beginning and middle look and put less emphasis on the end. Yeah. That reminds me of that diagram you see every once in a while shared on the socials of the glacier. You only see yeah. the top piece of it. You don't see yeah. the bulk of it that's under the water. Yeah, correct. Yeah, and it's like all the stuff below water is worry, anxiety, stress, <laughs> sacrifice, and at the tip, results. Yeah, that's a great image. And I think a lot of times some of that stuff is powerful, but for me, I've always been like an active learner where I need to see concepts in play or in motion for me to really adopt it and understand it. I've always been a guy that has to like touch and feel and bend and break stuff in order to, to really believe it. And that's what I'm, I'm hoping that maybe I can do as I, I share what my experience has been and platforms like this. And I wish someone would have given me maybe a little bit more of that uh, when I was coming up. And I, I feel like I could have potentially avoided some pitfalls and mistakes that uh, I have the scar tissue to prove now. It's 20, hindsight's always twenty twenty, but uh, that's good. My thing is to, to be more transparent than I believe what is generally popular out there about the ups and the downs. And the middle part and the medium spots and the somewhat highs and the somewhat lows and the really lows and the really highs rather than just playing the highlight reel. So I'd like your feedback on this. I, this is one of the reasons why I typically suggest that people start defining their why and why they're doing something and actually write it down to create that target. Otherwise, as humans, we will react to some sort of pain typically, but unless we define the why to the point of causing that discipline or something to drive for or to shoot for, we're never going to find the motivation enough to stick with it. Yeah. And that's what, what I, what I attempted to explain with like, why are you getting into real estate? What's the solvable problem that you think real estate is the solution to? And then running it through some level of assessment to be sure that assumption, that stab in the dark right? That piece of advice you got from, from someone that you know on, on TikTok actually matches with your willingness to how hard do you want to work? What's your risk threshold? What's your pain? Because right? it takes risk to start. It takes a tolerance for pain to not quit. And that's eventually the pieces that we don't talk about, that those two is what equals three, right? So we try and go from one, I have an idea, and we skip to the end game without plugging in the middle part, that's generally the hardest. And that would be, like you said, my advice to people before they get started with literally anything is what is the reasoning and the why behind this? And am I searching for something over here in real estate that doesn't really possess the ability to fulfill my why and I should redirect those efforts and maybe find it elsewhere? So I think you're hundred percent right that defining that purpose and why behind the, the, what you're doing will give you clarity or at least more clarity around whether or not you're moving in the right direction. Another thing that I think would be interesting is to talk a little bit about how, especially when we uh, get into starting this business, those activities that are worthwhile. I find that a lot of people will tell me that they're busy and they're obviously busy. They're running themselves ragged. And then when I ask them what they were doing for the day, 
they've yeah. been de- they've been designing a logo or a business card. It's defining those activities that actually generate the outcome you're shooting for. Yeah, I, I literally was having this conversation with a um, uh, an associate yesterday, and we were talking about just that a lack of time. And I said, do me a favor for one week, log everything that you spend time doing, whether it's 30 seconds or 30 minutes, write it down. And then I went through a week's worth of that activity. I ranked it at like a dollar per hour task, like less than 47% of this person who, by the way, runs a extremely successful business, 47% of their time was spent on actual tasks that were worth more than a hundred dollars an hour. They were literally doing 53% of the time, they were doing administrative tasks that easily we could have hired a $36,000 to $50,000 a year employee. And then we could have spent 75 to 90% of the time working on stuff that provided a 5 to 10x return rather than non-income related. Or And one of the things we we realized is there was, we we were out, out of capacity. So the, the, the hundred percent of his time still didn't get to a hundred percent of the work. So we were overworked and, 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 and undercapitalized on, on opportunity, right? Which is a crazy thing to think. How can you be overworked and, and really underpaid? That's because you're working on the wrong stuff. So we took that and say, hey, what's the lowest level task that you work on? Does that equivalent to a job description? And we said, yeah. So we created an entire job description and hired someone for, I think, nine bucks an hour. And now we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 hours a week that we can double down or TEDx on the more productive lucrative things that a CEO should be doing in a business. That's income producing rest. I think it's the one thing we don't time block for rest. We're like, hey, I got an eight, I got a nine, I got a 10, 13, I got a 11, I got a 115. And then we get to the end of the day and we're like a boxer that won 11 rounds. And we wonder why between two and five, we were ineffective because you got the snot beat out of you for six hours and then limped into a meeting or a strategic exercise with your team, or you had to deal with some type of emotional or tense issue that popped up in your business and you got to the end of the day and you were a bloody mess inside, right? You didn't necessarily have a bloody nose, but you'd gotten beaten up all day. So you have to also plan for, for decompressing. You have to plan for resetting. You have to plan for allowing yourself to, to just emotionally, you know, drift back down to ground zero before you walk into that next meeting and bring all that baggage with you. You just presented a really great tip there that I wanted to call out. You said in this situation, you gave the example of working with one of your students and was it a hundred dollars an hour you assigned to his time? No, his time's actually worth about $1,500 an hour, but 53% of the stuff that he was doing was below a hundred. So it was worth one tenth of his time. That's how it was bad. It was really, but he was busy, right? He was always busy doing stuff and, but moved the, the needle barely. But yeah, he, his time we identified was probably worth $1,000 an hour and more than half of his stuff he was working on was less than $100 an hour. Yeah, that's, that's my point there. Take what you want to earn, calculate the hourly wage you're paying, essentially paying yourself, and then ask yourself, designing that business card, is it worth X number of dollars an hour? If you're assigning yourself $100 an hour, is it worth $100 an hour for you to spend your time doing that activity? Yeah. Or what in your situation, hire somebody at $9 an hour to take care of it for you. That's great advice. So just to remind everybody again, look for Eric Brewer Invest on Instagram and follow Eric there. And if you've liked what you've heard so far, do us a quick favor and share it with one, one of your investor friends. So Eric, now that you've assigned and determined some of these strategies or tactics that need to be taken care of, but aren't worth your time investment. Let's talk a little bit about hiring that first person, like seeing that as, first of all, let's see it as an investment versus a cost. What type of mindset does somebody have to go through? Yeah, it's a great exercise. I would almost tell you to go one step backwards and I'll explain why. Oftentimes those tasks that are below our desired hourly compensation that we possess that are causing a bottleneck in our ability to be more productive are responsibilities and roles that either someone else in the organization is already technically responsible for, but we haven't developed the level of communication and trust with them where we've successfully delegated it. 
or maybe that person owns like 40% of the work. And then we always feel compelled to come behind and double check it or put our own spin on it because we always can make everything better. That's part of what makes us or the spirit of an entrepreneur. And the reality is you should go back and say, hey, in my existing organization with the people that I have and the roles that they sit in, where does this logically belong? Right? So for this particular person, we ended up not hiring a person to begin with. We found that there were three people in the organization that already should have owned that task. And we didn't just do a really good job of delegating, explaining it and training them around that. So we gave it to them and then slowly took it back. So that's step one, efficiency. Let's not necessarily go out and hire another person and create more of a burden on the expenses of the business. Number two, when you take that responsibility and that opportunity away, and the way I explained to him is he goes, I, I don't want to give them the extra work. And I said, you're not giving them extra work. You're robbing them of the opportunity to contribute at a higher level. And guess what? One of the reasons, main reasons why people leave an organization, they feel like they've reached a ceiling. There's no opportunity for growth. Well, who contributes to that? We do, dummies. We're the ones that takes all the opportunity away from them because we're a control freak, a micromanager. We haven't learned how to delegate and trust people to do things yet. So it ends up now creating more of an issue because you took that responsibility and that trust away from that person. They work for you for 18 months and they leave and you go, I don't understand why they left. I thought I treated them pretty well. I didn't overload them with work, but you underwhelmed them with responsibility. So that's number one. You got to go back and make sure you're doing a, a disservice to the business and you're cheating your people out of the opportunity to contribute at a higher level if you just run out and hire somebody right away. And then that new person is going to come. They're like, how does this affect my job? Why was I not given that opportunity? Why am I the last person to know? So it nips all that in the bud. You go back and you say, hey, Josh, I was you know, really doing an analysis on the work that I do each day. And I found that these like five to seven things require a lot of my time and thought to myself, why is Josh not doing this stuff? He's super capable. I really trust him. He's been here long enough where I think he really understands how we make these decisions and the standards that we use to make these decisions. I figured I'd sit down with you and go, what are your thoughts? And I'm telling you, seven times out of 10, they go, I would love that opportunity. Oftentimes, I'm trying to get my job done and it takes me two or three days to get an answer from you and it, it slows me down. If I could take on that responsibility, Honestly, I would love it and it'll really help me be more productive. I promise you that conversation will happen. So let's imagine you've gone through that and you go, hey, everybody's at capacity. This work is someone we need to hire a position for. I think the way that, that we look at that is we create that really job description and roles and responsibilities. And then I use um, a software and an assessment tool called Predictive Index, where I can plug really that job description in and it'll create an ideal behavioral profile for this person. Are they assertive? are more collaborative? Are they energetic and social? Or are they more of an introvert? Are they a person that operates with a ton of patience? Or are they constantly tapping their foot and can't wait to get to work because they operate with a ton of urgency? And are they a person that, you know, is really comfortable in a lot of ambiguity and doesn't need a lot of structure? Or is this in a person like an engineer or a, a tax consultant that needs to have every I dotted and T crossed and, and everything needs to fit into a little box? And then once you create that ideal profile, you go, hey, where do these people live and breathe? Where can I find a group of people like this? And then you go out and you start the, you can say, what does the average executive assistant make? What does the average sales manager make? What does the average integrator or COO or CEO or director of construction in, in my market make? And then you can basically use all of that research to create compensation, roles and responsibilities, KPIs, all of that stuff for that hire. And then you're much more strategic about putting the right person in the right seat, not subjectively guessing where you need help and hiring someone you think can do a good job. What's interesting here is that we're slowly, as we're having this conversation, at the beginning, we talked about a lot of people get into real estate in order to reclaim their time. But now you're really starting to put the pieces together in order to accomplish that goal. We've had, we're hiring a team, we're putting some people in place. Now, what steps are we going to be taking in order to start slowly removing ourselves from the day-to-day -day operations? And now we're becoming that from a deal maker to a business maker. Correct. So what are some additional steps and what do we have to go through to, to just get in the mindset of, I've hired a team that can handle it and I can start removing myself from the day-to-day -day operations? 
you need to create a new job description for yourself. So we spend a lot of time and energy creating. I just talked about roles and responsibilities, KPI, the ideal behavioral profile of an EA, a sales manager, an acquisitions person, an underwriter, a property analyst, a, a director of finance, a, a lead manager, all of these people, right? And then we fill all those seats and we have no job description. Literally the most important, messiest, least organized, generally person in the organization that has no framework for how they identify what they should be doing each day, how often they should do it, and the standards are way to measure whether or not they're doing a good job. So I think one of the things that I see a lot of business owners struggle with is as they build out infrastructure, they don't create or reimagine what their contributions are to the company now. I haven't, I have rarely heard anybody bring that up is writing or creating a job description for yourself. Uh, that's probably a pretty eye-opening activity. Yeah, it's a very humbling. <laughs> I, I can tell you for me, nearly any piece of advice I would dare to give um, is often rooted in personal experience. Otherwise, I don't feel qualified. And as I started to fill those seats and, and, and as I got more and more what I'll call like executive level support, like people that could actually build strategy and, and systems and processes with limited to no interaction for me as the one thing that I worked feverishly to rid myself of, which was deal-making and decision-making and management and oversight. Once it was gone, I lost a little bit of my identity because we often say that I wish I could get rid of that stuff, but once it's gone, it's part of our internal reward system, right? We, it, it was frustrating to have to take a call at 7.30 at night, but at least I knew I was needed. And if you don't have that job description and you hire these seats and you step away, if you're anything like me, which maybe you're not, but if you're anything like me, I lacked fulfillment at that point because I said I wanted my time back, but I hadn't decided what I would do with that time once I had it. Right. It's like hitting the lottery and not having a plan and they end up broking it. And then what happens is I drifted back into some of that deal making. I drifted back into some of that decision making. And while that gave me some sense of a little bit of that fulfillment back, it jeopardized the integrity and the authority that the people that I put in that seat deserve. And I ruined some relationships during that learning process and lost those people. And it wasn't until I went through that loss that I went, now I understand why they left which required humility because it's always easy for us to say this person wasn't ready. They weren't ready to level up. They didn't do this. They didn't do that. But at the end of the day, that all falls back onto our shoulders. It's one of the, the burdens we have to carry as the leader of an organization and everything in some capacity is, is our fault and nothing do we get the credit for. And you have to really embrace that thinking or I think you'll be an underwhelming leader. But that's just my experience and my experience has shaped my opinion. You've helped quite a few people now through this process. Could you give us an example of one of your students that when they got to this point, their business actually took off because they've essentially removed themselves as that bottleneck? Yeah, it's interesting because I, so this, the, what the, the, the little snippet that I shared with you from my experience is about three years old, right? So five years ago, I, I really started treating it like a business. Four years ago, I realized that I had built my infrastructure to service or survive in the old model. So then I had to gradually go through nearly 100% turnover. Then I started to refill those seats the best way that I knew how, but I was in the infant stages of learning how to run a business and leader. And then I had another set of, say, two and a half years ago, three years ago, another set of turnover. So I feel like I only actually got reasonably decent at this three years ago. And... So the majority of people that I've helped are, are literally at, I'm a one man band. I'm making a bunch of money, but I'm miserable when I get home because three years ago, I had already been through that phase two years prior to that. So I'm like, Hey, mm -hmm. I saw how this worked. I've trialed and, and, and been through trial and error. I now figured it out. Let me help you with that. So the majority of people I'm helping now, if you, if you think about it, like I look at phases of business where I'm a, a solopreneur. Second is that I have, and I've become a, a contributing team member. Third is I become a competent manager. Fourth is I'm entering into executive level leadership. And then five, and, and Jim Collins, if you've ever read any of his books, he talks about 
a level five leader. So the majority of, of success stories of people that I've been able to work with, we've taken from level one. They're now deeply rooted in level three, operating as a competent manager. And we're starting to push that ceiling and start to have conversations about, hey, what would it look like for me to transition from manager of a business to leader of people? And uh, yeah, I, I probably have somewhere north of over a dozen of those clients that I've worked with one-on-one, -on -one, but it takes time, right? Just like I said, I could share with you overnight success stories, but I'm probably two years in with most of those people and we got a long road to go. We've made measurable progress. We've had some small wins and we're tracking, but I wouldn't dare to say that I've taken anybody from level two to level five yet. I'm still working myself to successfully move from four to five. And again, I, I try not to give advice where I lack experience. So generally, I think what you find is the people that I work with encourage, coach, mentor, and have the blessing of being able to influence. I only try and focus on the areas where I feel like I can speak from a level of expertise. Yeah, I've, I've just found that a lot of people, whether they realize it or not, we get into this mindset of being a one-man band. Everything lands on in your lap, your plate. And to shake that concept loose and to realize that eventually you become the bottleneck and you're actually the one who's putting a brakes on the growth of the business is actually pretty surprising. There's a, a good friend of mine that has a saying, he says, if I do all of the work, I have a great income. If I figure out how to hire and delegate the work, I have a great business. So you have to figure out what you want. Do you want a great income or a great business? A great income is directly attached to your labor. A great business is not. So in real estate, we talk a lot about leverage. If you decide to be a solopreneur, you're abandoning the number one or very number top of the list principles in, in, in real estate, which is leverage. If you don't leverage your time and experience in other people's labor, it's the same as paying cash for every rental and living off of $4,800 a month net income, where you could have a hundred rentals with the same amount of your own capital dis dispersed, but now you've 10 x your net income, you've 10 x right? You've actually created a layer of insulation. So if two of your four rentals goes vacant, 50% of your income's evaporated. Or if you have a hundred rentals and 20 of them go vacant, it's only 20%. So leverage is wildly criticized because of excess, but when you're finding the right balance of leverage in your business and in your portfolio, that's where true magic happens in my experience. Eric, this was a great conversation. Again, I want to remind everybody to find you on Instagram. Look for Eric Brewer Invest. I'm going to make sure to have that as a clickable link in the show notes. But before I let you go, Eric, I have some rapid fire questions. We'll close Let's out. Let's do it. Here's your chance to bust a real estate investing myth that you might have heard. What would you like to bust here today? I would say there's a real estate myth that it's hard. Real estate is simple, but it's not easy. And I think there needs to be an asterisk next to that explanation where people say it's as hard as we make it, but it's really a simple business. I can tell you that in 2006, seven and eight, a bunch of bought a bunch of failed flips as the market pivoted. And I made a commitment to not sell them and lose money. And I turned them into rentals. And I looked like an absolute genius in 2019 when I refinanced those. But really the only thing I did was I, I bought real estate and held it. Literally every other aspect of that, I paid too much. I over-renovated or under-renovated, over-leveraged. And the only thing I did that was smart is I held it. And 10 years later, I look like a real estate mogul. Do you have a book recommendation that everybody should check out? Oh my goodness. Depending on where you are. So for me, I think there's a little bit of recency bias and, and I, I can see the pain in, in, a, in an operator's eyes when they talk to me about how they love their income, but they hate their job. And one of the books that really, I think, helped me jumpstart my journey to, to freedom was The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni to help me really understand how to communicate with people, how to be a leader, how to lean into healthy conflict, what the real value of trust was, the value um, of accountability and measuring and data. So I think if you're thinking about starting or growing a business, I would prioritize the book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. In your personal life or your business life, what is one tool you can't live without? My wife. That's a, I've, I had one other person who said that. Yeah. My, I have six children. I'm so blessed uh, that my family literally means everything to me. I ain't get a little choked up talking about it. And that is what really drives 
my desire to keep going. Like I'm at a place and in, in, in age at 47 and income where I've been so blessed to, to be in just great positions with my career since I was literally the age of 20, where I don't necessarily have to work anymore. But what drives me to work is the legacy and the impact that I'm able to make on my community. And that really starts with my family and six kids, like the legacy looked like this when I had two kids. And now that pie needs to either be sliced six ways or there needs to be a bigger pie. So I'm trying to build a bigger pie for my children to benefit from. If and that's only possible pie. because of my wife. Like I, I literally have as close to zero responsibility as home as you could possibly imagine. And it's only because my wife is, is so supportive and understanding and so resilient when it comes to taking care of our children that it allows me to, to spend a large amount of energy and time and focus on my business. And when I get home, I get just to be a husband and a dad and do most of the fun stuff. She handles all the hard stuff. If you could go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be? None. I think the risk of going back, you ever see the movie, I'm hoping you've got to be near my age, but if you remember back to the future, because I said this to like a 23 year old and he goes back to the future, what's that? And I lost all momentum. I couldn't even tell the story anymore. He just, he ruined my whole vibe. But I run, there's things that I would go back and I wish I didn't have to live through, but I'm fearful that if I removed that scar tissue, that experience, I'm now 47 with six kids and much more assets and stuff under management. I have way more to lose. So I'm thankful for those lessons that I learned back then that felt like losses because now I feel like it's built a moat around the things that I care about that allow me to make just much more, many more decisions rooted in wisdom and less on emotion. I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't give myself any advice. I think I love exactly where I am and I, I wouldn't want to change anything about that. In under 60 seconds, you have to give everybody a tip or trick that they can implement in their business today. What would it be? So I learned this lesson from a book called Who Not How. And I'll summarize it in less than 60 seconds that it's human nature for us to procrastinate. And rather than us criticizing or, or, or putting ourselves or others down because of procrastination, try and understand when it happens and, and how to expedite that process. And the book, Who Not How, they tell you that generally as a, a person, when we have human behavior that, that causes us to procrastinate it's because we're too fixated on how we're going to start something, how we're going to solve it, how we're going to fix it. And really, we should pivot that to say, who can help me get started? Who can help me fix it? Who can I partner with? Who can teach me this? So in 60 seconds or less, I would say, stop worrying about the how and figure out who. Eric, is there a question or concept you wished we would have covered here today? No, sir. I really enjoyed our conversation. I thought you did a great job of facilitating and asking the right question at the right time. And I'm just thankful that we had this opportunity to spend this time together. Yeah, Eric, it was great to meet you and you're welcome back anytime. I hope you'll take me up on that. Yeah, I'd love to do it again. Like one last time. Look for Eric at Eric Brewer Invest on Instagram, and we'll see you next time.